Van de Becken. You are the director of the forthcoming Congress of the Euro Federation of Psychoanalysis, PIPOL 9, which has been taking place consistently for the last 10 years and will be held in Brussels on the 13th and 14th of July 2019. We would like to ask you some questions about it, starting from the title that was given to this important event, which over 1,300 delegates from all over the world are expected to attend. Tell us about this statement, the unconscious and the brain, nothing in common. It poses an affirmation, clear, sharp. The thesis poses that between the unconscious and the brain, there is a non-relation. It's even a stronger thesis when we consider that in current discourses it may not, not be evident at all. In fact, it even presents itself as going against evident, against the evidence of that which science carries out as progress. It's a thesis to be put to work. The burden now lies on us to support it and demonstrate it. And the central question is what is the need and what major clinical, ethical and political issues are at stake for the Euro Federation of Psychoanalysis, which brings together four major Lacanian-oriented schools of psychoanalysis in the world, to choose to make of this thesis, of this assertion that the unconscious and the brain have nothing in common, the title of its next international congress. This is not obvious because we are surrounded by an atmosphere in terms of current discourses for which they have everything in common. Can you briefly describe for us to what extent there is an opposition being posed here between psychoanalysis and science, and also the distinction between science and the ideological use and abuse of scientific discoveries that constitutes scientism? In fact, we can say that major discoveries in science have been scarce for two or three decades. You know it's a common thesis. Rather, it is the dimension of technique which seems animated by a desire where, in a few words, they say to be close, it seems that it promises us advances and progress always greater. Moreover, the influence of the advancements of technology is day by day more important in our lives, to the point of modifying or influencing our most everyday behaviors, often for the better. It facilitates our lives and it opens up potentialities that were still unexpected only a short time ago. Look at everything we can do and what we can access simply through our smartphone. They have become almost a technical hot road of our own bodies. We can sometimes no longer separate ourselves from them. Technical hot road of our bodies whose forms they will take not the day after tomorrow, but tomorrow will be, to say at least, even more amazing, with a whole series of implant possibilities and renewed connections. These scientific and especially technological advances are also massively present in the medical field. Medical imaging and magnetic resonance techniques are technically a major breakthrough. This applies to the entire medical field, but this especially opens, this especially opens up all the hopes of understanding, and this is always accompanied by therapeutic projects. It 
opens up all the hopes of understanding the functioning of the organ which appears at the most extraordinary of the animal field, but also until now the most mysterious with regard to its functioning, the brain. Research on the brain is massive, benefiting from outside funding. We hear about it every day. If this allows, and it already allows it, to develop new therapies regarding, for example, brain damage, nobody will complain. All these discoveries will be inscribed within the dimension of what is called human genius. Human genius uh, of which we also know the twisted uses that can be made of it. But this ever great advance of technology and all the hopes it lays also produces the resurgence of a new materialism. And materialism is not new in Europe or at least in its Latin influenced part anyway. We come perhaps from about 50 years when materialism had a bad press. It is then the resurgence of a new materialism, particularly, and this is what has psychoanalysts interest us the most, in a field that had been turned away, the so-called called psyche, the human psyche, or even what we call mental life. We are promised the foundation of a new science of mental life. And in France recently, the, 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 appointment of, uh, the appointment as president of the Scientific Council, which orients the general politics regarding nationalist education, uh, the appointment of Stanislas de Haan, was a controversial event. He is a well-known and influential cognitivist and neuroscientist psychologist whose inaugural lecture he gave at the Collège de France was entitled Towards a Science of Mental Life. It is therefore he who directs for the moment the programs of national education in France with the aim of deeply refounding them according to his research. Cognitivism, uh, which presents itself as a novelty and the future of men, is in fact a very old acquaintance. We can say that it is the new habit which which it's adorned what was called behaviorism and which no longer hides its attempts to conquer. And behaviorism was uh, not so long ago discredited in the field of the human and the psychical due to its totalitarian uses of conditioning and uh, what resulted from them. But it has found again, through the research on the functioning and biology of the brain, we are cerebral imaging, how to reinstall its coat of arms, its coat of arms, and the hope of founding a new materialism of subjectivity by applying to it the mathematical model. So, the explanation of the field of the human by this model finds in their eyes no limit. The field of the psi disciplines are particularly affected by its resurgence of a materialism applied to the field of the psychical. A new paradigm wants to impose or is really already imposed on psi practices. Let's say it, and this is why we as psychoanalysts are uh, bothered by it. It's mostly an attempt to take power in the health system and the master's discourses. A will for the psychologist to join 
its horizon by being a health worker, put at the service of what has become now the major and the globalized signifier which traverses our lives. Whatever the political, political regime we find ourselves in, namely the generalized productivity. This is part of the logic of quantification when one apprehends psychical life only in its cognitivist dimension. So, that what seemed uh, until then to escape the logic of the market, uh, the inner hurt of each one, is reduced, assimilated, adapted and controlled. Everything is taken up, including the dimension of psyche, in the register of efficiency, of production, which crushes the human and which produces new symptoms directly linked to this imperative, such, for example, as burnout. In all fields, performance is the key word. It's become the key word. The psychological field no longer escapes reduced number of sessions, psychotherapy reduced to the rank of remediation, symptoms apprehended as disorders to be managed, behavioral, behavioral protocols to be applied, mindfulness to be acquired and quantifiable results to be obtained. All this does not stand in the way of the ever-increasing successful of the most esoteric practices. Well, we can say that to apply a scientific materialism to the psychological field is a fundamental mistake. Why? Because at the one hand, it reduces confuses the psychical with the organic and at the other end because it reduces the psychical only to the field of learning, re-education and suggestion. It also reduces the brain to a machine that processes information, comparing it to a computer certainly ultra complex but whose model is a turing machine so if you look a, a bit into this we you will not be shocked when i tell you the following brain sciences opens open up fields of significant progress in the strictly neurological dimension and it's a good thing but when cognitivism uses the techniques of neurosciences and it links itself to them to demonstrate their own field, the promises are great, but discovery often of a confusing banality. Once you have noticed that the announcement or publication of results of the so-called discoveries made in the field of cognitive neurosciences are always made with great noise, very well related by the media. They are accompanied always with grand promises of major developments and therapeutic application to come. But once this is done, we hasten to say that nothing is done yet that it is not sure, that it is certainly to come in the future, but probably for much later, because all this is at the same time very complex. If you repair that, you will see this gimmick resurface every time. So, let's move on to the other term present in the title the unconscious. What does psychoanalysis have to say to other disciplines? 
to other professionals with whom they often work in mental health and education. What do you expect will be transmitted at PPOL 9 that will be of interest for the dialogue between those who work in institutions and other settings for applied psychoanalysis? Well, in the same way, cognitive neuroscience always ends up denying the dimension of what we, Lacanian psychoanalysts, call the dimension of the unconscious. Either they aim to deny its existence, some say they do not believe it, or they completely denature it by confusing and linking the unconscious with which they refer from time to time to psychoanalysis to non-conscious brain processes. Here too, it is a fact of structure. The most honest among them, however, recognize that this unconscious of which they speak and for which they rely on the magnetic resonance images of the brain is an unconscious that has nothing to do nothing to do with the unconscious of which psychoanalysis speaks. Lionel Lacache, for example, who is, a, a well -known, who is well known in France, makes a thesis of this, ironically, to the point that one of his books is entitled The New Unconscious. He develops there that Freud made a great discovery but a discovery like Christopher Columbus, he says, uh, that he discovered the existence of something other than what he thought to discover, and that he is thus the precursor of neurosciences, which have finally discovered the true dimension of the unconscious, and which they name, rather honestly, cognitive unconscious. I refer uh, to the videos that broadcast uh, some of the resonances that uh, take for many psychoanalysts of our field the thesis of our next congress. In one of these, Marie-Hélène Bruce, who many of you are very familiar with her, points out that um, yes, we have all incorporated behavioral types of learning. We have plenty of them. She argues that it is fortunate that we have a series of learnings, uh, acquired, acquired learnings, that we must not relearn every time and that operate in an automatic way and of which we are no longer aware from what moment where they were acquired or learned. For example, she made reference to spelling. Fortunately, we must not relearn to write each time. But there are many others. Uh, a rule series of phenomena that related to the neural sphere. Things learned which function without us being aware of them. Without us being conscious of them. For example, if you start thinking about walking as you walk, it can quickly become very tricky. But memory also responds to modes of functioning in which neural connections are paramount. And brain damage demonstrates their direct impact on this phenomena. But the unconscious of psychoanalysis is not that. And the emergence of this new materialism that claims now to size the purest of the psychical dimension to reduce them to chemical phenomena or learning, including love, affects, feelings, etc., invite us, we psychoanalysts, and it is one of the stakes of this People Congress to redefine what the unconscious is in psychoanalysis and thereby to redefine what is psychoanalysis. On the one hand, this is something that must always be redone. 
again and again. It is always to be redone because the dimension that psychoanalysis isolated as we can say uh, as a natural tendency to always close itself up to be denied and you know why because of his uh, sexual meaning it carries a discovery that is constantly scandalous and disturbing in this Psychoanalysis is like uh, the symptom, the symptom of the program of civilization. As if there was a force, uh, and you know this is a Freudian thesis, of this there was a force that did not want to know anything about it. Or that there is something that bothers, disturbs, and one would like to reduce it, to crush it. The field of psychoanalysis is absolutely not immune to this slope. No one is immune, not even psychoanalysts. None of us, since it is the function of the ego to defend itself against the discovery on which psychoanalysis is based. there is a never present force working to make psychoanalysis as therapeutic be reduced to readapting psychotherapy and you know it was Lacan's major criticism of the psychoanalyst of his day as he called them that they had managed in their own practice to close what he called the cutting edge of his truth and to distort his practice and you know that he attributes one of the causes of this to the American influence of on his practice which was isolated under the name of ego psychology this is what Jacques Lacan denounced and constantly reminded and this is what his teaching has tried and tries every time to rectify. And in a certain way, it is only through this movement that penetrates even the psychoanalysts themselves that we understand, and we can read, this very strange phenomenon of psychoanalysts who believe that neuroscience is the future of psychoanalysis. And I would say that people nine and its team are necessary to counteract this because this perspective is growing. Psychoanalysts cannot think that neuroscience is the future of psychoanalysis except by going astray, this is the Lacanian thesis, on the very nature of what the unconscious is in psychoanalysis. Neuroscience has this immediate effect of removing the dimension of the unconscious in the psychoanalytic and Lacanian sense. It is the price to pay to join two fields which are each relevant, but relevant in their own field. They are relevant in their own field, but they have nothing in common. And they can only be united at the price of making one of them disappear. Both fields touch a real, they define a real, but this real is not the same. We can leave it then on this very important point. This real is not the same. Thank you, Yves van der Becken, for replying to these questions and see you in Brussels next July.